I'm Rin. I'm Scott. We are the hosts of Geek Nice. It is a radio show podcast about nerdy stuff. So if you enjoy this at all, there's a lot of it on the internet. And today, we're talking about the rage of the quitter. Mm-mm-mm. How many of you have rage quit a game before? How many of you have gotten mad because someone else rage quit the game that you were in? Yeah, that's me, that's me. How many of you are here because you want to learn how to rage quit better? <laughs> oh, that's not good. We're not going to teach you that. We're going to teach you other things. So there's a very important concept uh, about quitting, and that is that games are not real life. Games are games for a reason. Games are play. The consequences are not real. Obviously, some pedant out there is like, what about esports where there's prizes on the line? We're not talking about that. You can quit games. Someone in the NFL could just walk away from the field. There might be other consequences, but they can quit the game. If you're playing Carcassonne and someone sucks, you can just walk away. If you can't quit, it's not a game, it's life. (laughs) If it's a game, you can quit it, because it's some social fabricated construct that you're temporarily, you know, uh, agreeing to participate in, and you can leave it at any time. Now, the problem is, most game designers don't think a lot about quitting. They think about the cool parts of the game, the fun part. The playing, but not quitting. So game designers don't consider quitting as a mechanic, yet, no matter what your game is, there's always the option of quit under every other menu item. It's press X to pay respects, press the power button to quit. Right, so just like even programming software, it doesn't matter what you write. Somebody can always do like control all delete and kill your program. You need to have code to handle that. And if you're writing a game, whether it's a video game, a board game, a sport, or whatever, you need to be able to handle quitting. So there's only, you know, we're going to talk about why people actually quit games. And it turns out there's only so many, like if you really break it down or really crystallize it, there's a relatively small number of reasons why people quit games. And the primary one is that they're bored. Right? I mean, you know, you're only going to live for so long. I mean, what am I going to end up living to? Like 70 if I'm lucky, right? Yeah, Something you, you like can that? push 80 maybe. Maybe, right? I'm not, I'm not that healthy. Uh, <laughs> right? If I'm going to sit down and play a game, right, of any kind, I'm not going to, you know, my time is valuable. Why, why would I spend more time on something that is not entertaining me and not giving me any value or joy or anything, right? I'm just going to quit that. Right? Yeah. So, like, Marge asks you to play this card game, and it seems like it's really long and boring. You get bored with it, and she's having fun, but you're not, and that's a big reason why people quit. They're just bored. They're not having fun. It took too long. Now your friends are gone. Someone lied to you and said that that train game where you draw a bunch of train stuff on a train board and simulate the year 1846 takes 20 minutes, and you're in your fourth hour, and you're about to be late for dinner or, like, school. Uh, you know, you just left the expo hall and you really wanted to go to that panel by those Geek Nights guys at 6 30. And someone's like, no, 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 we can get this board game done before then. Don't worry, you'll make it in time. It definitely won't fill up, you'll be cool. All right? And they were right about the not filling up, but they were totally wrong about the game being done by 6 30 because you were totally going to quit that biz. Yep, now this often happens particularly because someone will lie to you. Like, I'm not joking. Someone will lowball the estimate of how long the game will take because they're so desperate for you to play with them. They want that game to happen, and they're trying to cause your other consequences just so you'll stay and play the game. If they were honest, you wouldn't have played in the first place. Yep, also people are really bad at estimating how long a game will take, and some games are really bad at telling you how long they're actually going to take. Like the Omegathon that kept having ties in the first few rounds. Mm-hmm. The game was not what you expected. A lot of times, you know, uh, usually, and not just people trying to get you to play their tabletop game at PAX, but also, you know, video game publishers, right? They're trying to sell the game to you. If they're honest to you about what the game is, oh yeah, Final Fantasy, you're just gonna watch a movie and push A a whole bunch of times, it's gonna take you 30 hours, that's not really gonna make you wanna buy it. Right? They're going to lie to you about what the game is. You have this great imagination when you look at the box or watch the trailer, and the reality will often not live up to it. Now, often, like this happened to me sometimes, too. Like, Team Fortress 2, when it came out, I was really excited about it. Like, really excited. Because I played Team Fortress a lot. I was waiting for that game. And when it came Team out, Fortress. it was not what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And that was a real bad day, and I quit playing it real quick. Sometimes... People forfeit. Sometimes someone will quit a game to make a statement. This game is broken. This is unfair. Political statements, social statements, there's a lot of reasons why this will happen. In this case, there's a high school that is a charter school that doesn't, it has to, it doesn't have to let everyone into the school. So they self-selected for high school football players who are as big as real football players. 
and it's super dangerous to play against them, so all the other teams are rage quitting. Well, not rage quitting, they're just quitting. Right, I mean, against if, they, if you have an, a, a, a football team, it's already really dangerous to play football in any circumstance, but you're gonna play against this team of genetic creeps who are like, you know, the size of adults who just happen to be under 18, right? You're basically putting your, your normal sized kids' lives on the line. You, you forfeit rather than play them, right? Because some things are more important. The key is that a forfeit occurs when there is some extrinsic reason for someone to quit, and it's performative. They're doing it to make a statement, not just to avoid the consequences. Right, of they're saying this should not be allowed, this team shouldn't be allowed to be in the league, right? This method of recruiting shouldn't be allowed for high school football, etc. Yep, or this game's not, well, we'll get to that. Yeah. They're losing. A lot of people say that they want to play games because games are fun, but really they want to play games because they want to win. And when they're not winning, they're not having fun. Right, now some people take this situation and their solution is to quit when they're not winning so that they always win. And they never have to see a screen that says you lose or game over on it. Other people handle the situation by cheating so that they always win. Right? So it's just up to the individual person in the individual game which of these two roads they're going to go down if they're the sore loser type. Right? It's something you need to think about both as a player and a designer. Why are people playing games? On one side, there's to have fun. On the other side, there's to win. And you might think those overlap. They barely overlap. We have a lecture we've given about how to win at games. Winning at games is not fun. <laughs> so that is the score in an ice hockey game that occurred while we were in college. We were at this game, we watched the entirety of the game. It was crazy fun. I'm surprised there's still an article about a hockey game from You know how hard it was to find this article? 2002, that's how old we are now. We were yeah, in college in 2002. We'd been in college for a while in 2002. But this was a hockey game where at the beginning of the third period, if Newman had quit, I couldn't have blamed him. Because yes, technically they could win. There is you can, it takes only like a couple seconds to score a hockey goal. You win a face-off, you shoot, it's in the goal if the goalie sucks. And then you could get like 24 goals in like a minute. I mean, all right, so you got 24 goals in a pretty short span. It's not going to be the same. But it's like, it, this wasn't impossible for them to win, but effectively, their probability of winning was near zero. Not absolute zero, but near zero, right? So they may as well quit. Why keep skating around for no reason? Now, you'll see some games will have like a mercy rule or some reason to like let the game end early, but I wouldn't blame these people if they left. Much more important, this happens in games a lot, especially tabletop games. They've definitely lost. They are mathematically eliminated from winning, but the Monopoly game's got four more hours. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of games out there where your chances of winning are not near zero, but actually absolute zero. You cannot win this game, but because of the rules of the game, it's not over yet. You know, maybe, you know, the time is about to run out in a game of football, and you know, you're, the team, they make them go out there and take a knee. Why? Just end the game. What's the point? Yep. Right? It's generally a sign of, uh, not bad design, but definitely poor design. It's an overlooked thing. A lot of games, people get really excited about designing a game, especially a tabletop game, because this is where this happens a lot. They don't think a lot about what the end game experience is like, and it leads to situations like this. They have an incentive to quit. What if a game doesn't punish you for quitting? You'll find a lot of people, you saw this in the DS online era, a lot of people have perfect records. Yeah, in Mario, in Mario Kart DS for the first DS, not 3DS, if you just turned off your DS or quit a game when you were about to lose, it wouldn't count on your record. So I had like a perfect record. I was like 40 and 0 in Mario Kart races. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the thing is, whenever I was winning a race, every right before I crossed the finish line, everyone else just disappeared. Right. But if you give someone an incentive to quit, uh, they will quit because that is to their utility, like what they're getting out of a game. Like they're playing to win the game, and if they're losing the game, and by quitting, they can unlose the game, they're gonna do it because they're playing to maximize their utility. They're playing to win the game. They're gonna do it. It's so weird that you could be designing a game, right? And you think, who would go to the player and be like, hey, if you quit the game, I'll give you a cookie. But the game designers make games that literally do that. Like, hey, please quit my game. All right. So this is an important one. The game is unfair. Now, Un I, don't, unfair. I don't know that the suspect is cheating. I don't know that he has an aimbot and a wall hack, but I suspect that he is cheating. It's, I mean, the suspect could just be ridiculously good at Counter-Strike, and Daisy, Robin, Pelican, Nautilus, and Mass could be really, really bad, or just AFK or something, and all lined up in a row with their heads just right. It's possible, but I, I don't think so. But no one wants to play a game that is actually unfair, because that means that all of the skill, everything you're doing, the actions you're taking in the game,
don't matter. They're pointless. Yeah. So when you're playing like Overwatch or something, and you think someone's cheating, it ruins the experience for you. You have no incentive to play. Unless you also cheat. It doesn't matter if they're actually cheating. There's no difference between a perfect sniper with human eyes and a perfect sniper with a computer, theoretically. You have no way to know if someone's cheating or not, especially as a player. So it doesn't matter if someone's really good or they're cheating, the reality, the effect is the same. You feel that the game is unfair and you're more likely to quit. And a lot of people quit for this exact reason. Imagine if I'm playing basketball against LeBron, right? He's not, he doesn't need to cheat. I'm not gonna touch the ball, ever. Right? I'm not going to take a shot ever. Maybe he'll let me take one and block it and then go and dunk it. Right? It's not fun. Now imagine me playing basketball against someone with a jetpack. They're cheating, but it's the same as playing against LeBron. It's unfair either way. Right? So here's a case study. This is something really interesting that happened. It's like a weird case of uh, emergent behavior in game design. So there is a person who was basically the best sniper in Overwatch in the world. And as just, far as we know, not cheating. Just really, 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 really good. Preternaturally good. Clicking on heads, the best. And they had a complaint <laughs> to Blizzard. There was something going on. They, they couldn't join games. Like, there was a bug where they kept trying to play games, and their queue time would just go up and up and up and up and up forever. And it was only this person. It wasn't, like, people in the area. Yeah, somebody else. on a certain server. I'm assuming just a lot of you... One Person. A lot of you work in IT or something. If a bunch of people have a problem, that's one thing. If one person has a problem and no one else has that problem, that's a very different thing. They had the same problem on multiple computers in different places. Just so one person. There's another option that's gone now in Overwatch where you could say, you know, it's an anti-harassment tool. This player is bothersome, is bad in some way. They're harassing me. I want to avoid this player. They took this option out. What actually happened is something like the majority of all Overwatch players who had ever played against this person said avoid this player. They pre-rage quit to avoid the later rage quit. Person that is terrifying to a game designer to have to think about those contingencies. So now this person couldn't find a game to play with because literally everyone was avoiding them. Or at least every game that they could be inserted into had a player who was trying to avoid them. And so there was, they couldn't find a match anywhere. <laughs> the opponents are cheap. Not cheating, but doing something cheap. If you remember the old Mario Kart DS, it was one of the better Mario Karts, except for one problem. That's the second Mario Kart DS reference. Uh, yeah. You could play the game the normal Mario Kart way and drift around the corners, get your sparks, and that's fine. Or you could cause permanent injury to your left thumb and your wrist and waggle the DS like this <laughs> and snake... Constantly. Right. Red You're supposed to only get sparks on the turns when you drift around them. In this Mario Kart DS, you can get sparks on the straightaways by going like this. Right? And basically boost around the whole track and no one can catch you. Now before you ask what kind of monster would do that, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> you did that every time. And the problem was, you got into this situation where this is a perfectly valid strategy that's been built into the game. You didn't it's not, hack the game, no game genie, no nothing. It was, it was totally legit. It's arguably not even an exploit or a glitch. And Nintendo never patched it out or anything. They don't patch crap. So, every time I played online, I'd start snaking, and the other people would just quit immediately. So I started not snaking until the third lap, and then I'd snake, and they'd still quit. And then eventually I gave up, and I would join other people's games where they named the game, like, No Snaking, and I would snake, and they would all quit. They couldn't stop you. Right, it's so the same situation as No Rush 15 or No Rush 10 if you're playing StarCraft. So what's, so what's meant by cheap? Right? Is that there's something that is very powerful, right? That is very easy to do. Usually when you have a game, techniques or skills or strategies that are very effective are very difficult to do, right? You have a magic card, you're playing Magic the Gathering, it's a giant creature, like a 10-10. It just costs a lot of mana to put that out on the table, right? And doing snaking is like, oh, it's a 10-10 for one green mana, no drawback. No, I All right. Think just like the perception thing before, it doesn't matter if the strategy is actually cheap. Snaking was actually really, really, really hard to do. Well, but, physically hard, but yeah. not, you know... Well, the, so strategy-wise, it was actually pretty difficult, too, on some of those snaky maps. That's why you played Dry Bones, Dry Bomber only. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but it does not matter. The, it's like a magician. It doesn't matter how hard the trick is to actually do. All that matters is how hard the audience thinks it is to do. It's the same thing with this. If the audience is losing to M. Bison, M. Bison is cheap. And that's the end of that. The appearance of cheapness is the same as the appearance of cheating, and people will quit. So, 
Esports are a thing now. Like, esports are really, really big. And this is a real problem. In sports, people get hurt. If you hurt yourself, quit the game. Don't power through real injuries because you're not getting paid what some of the NFL is getting paid. I don't think anyone here is getting paid to play any game. Right? <laughs> so it's like your body, right? We're all sadly humans. We're very fragile, right? And not going to survive forever. I've already discussed this. Right? <laughs> if there's something wrong with you, and you know, it's not right, and you need to go get help, even if it's just going to the bathroom, or you cut yourself and need a band-aid, or you're vomiting, or who knows what, you broke your leg, you really shouldn't be now playing a game at this time. The only game you should be playing is get to the hospital as quickly as possible. <laughs> right? Don't play any other games. Now, you might say, what about tabletop? But if you've ever played Jungle Speed with the original wooden totem, yes, even tabletop. I'm sure we all know someone who's lost a finger to jump a giant thing can be pretty dangerous if it falls on your head or something. <laughs> <laughs> Even just a normal tabletop game, like, if anyone remembers this famous incident from a fart thread like 15 years ago... Oh, there's a fart listener back then. <laughs> there's a reason why old wargaming clubs have something called the chair fund. That is to replace chairs that are broken in the course of playing perfectly sedentary tabletop games. And you can imagine what you will from that. We used to play, you know, some old war game people, right, upstate, and they were, they were, you know, their chairs were not the most durable, right? So, this is a really important topic. A lot of people quit games, or appear to rage quit games, because they're straight up being harassed. Someone's being racist, someone's being sexist, someone's following them around and killing them just to grief them. This is one of the biggest problems in games right now. And we're going to talk a bit and about... I'm sure people talk about it at every panel, all of that, since the beginning. But you got to understand, when someone quits a game, like you're playing Overwatch and someone quits, especially on the other team, you don't know what was going on in the team chat of that other team. So you can't always assume the person that quits, they might not be rage quitting, they might be forfeiting. And there's no way to know that. We'll get back to harassment later in the panel. So, sometimes there's an intrinsic stopping point in a game, like between rounds, between matches, at a save point in a single player game. So, sometimes the game itself will set a tempo where there's points where it feels right to quit. And there's not that much wrong with that. Some people will rage quit at those points, like right before the score screen comes up. You'll see a lot of people suddenly quit competitive games. Yeah. You usually think of this stopping point as like a temporary quitting, right? Like you're quitting, but you're going to come back. But what happens to me a lot is like I'll get to some place like this, I'll quit, and then I won't remember to come back, and that game is basically done for me. Right? <laughs> if I don't remember, like I'll play Zelda, and then if I don't remember to start playing it again the next day, it's like that was actually the end. I just didn't realize it at the time. More important is the extrinsic stopping point. The, the sun rises, and you have to go to work. Uh, you've got to catch the last train out of downtown Seattle to get back home. I guess there's no trains here. You're in tabletop and it's midnight and the enforcers kick your ass out. We got kicked out last night because we overstayed our we welcome. We get kicked out every night. <laughs> <laughs> but this can also, I was playing Overwatch. I play a lot of Overwatch lately, so I talk about it a lot. But I was playing with my team. We're doing some, some serious biz. And suddenly one of my friends says in the voice chat very calmly, uh, my daughter vomited on me and then disconnected. <laughs> Can't do much about that. That happens. So, this is an industry term. <laughs> this is what you're all here for, but this is an industry term. This is when people actually rage quit in a fit. And there's two kinds of rage... Well, there's three kinds of rage quits. Five kinds. Five kinds, ten kinds. The pure rage quit. We've all done the pure rage quit. This is when you quit a game. The controller gets thrown across the room. You just stand up and run away. You just scream and leave. You kick the comp. Whatever happens, you quit the game. Usually this happens either because A, someone has like some anger problems going on, or B, because you didn't quit earlier, right? You stuck with it despite being mad. Getting madder and madder and madder. Mad you should have quit the first time. Right? But you didn't. You stuck with it. You thought, okay, that Mario Kart race, Rim was snaking. He won't snake the next time. Right? <laughs> oh, Rim's not even in this race. There won't be any snakers. And then you get to the third lap. Oh, and Rim's then... alternate account is in here now. <laughs> right. So the important aspects of a normal rage quit, which is much more acceptable than the next one, is that it's just to stop experiencing that bad feeling. People rage quit like this because they feel bad and they want the stimulus that's causing that to go away. There is fire, fire bad. Fire! That is this. This is a much more interesting situation. <laughs> I like how it's kind of blurry. You can, you can, there's some good environmental storytelling here. You should find this video on YouTube. It's good. This video is great. But 
the destructive rage quit is so much more sinister. It's like if this is second degree murder, this is first degree murder. <laughs> because when someone destructively rage quits, they're not quitting to stop the bad feeling. They want to ruin the game for everybody else. They want to harm other people. There is a performative component. They are quitting as performance. They want other people to see them quit. It's, it's an aspect of vengeance going on here, right? Because basically this other guy on the right is he's just playing the game by the rules, doing some ridiculous combo that wins the game or something, right? And it's making the guy on the left really upset because, well, there's nothing he can do about it. Uh, and the guy on the right is totally chill, right? He's just like, I'm just playing magic here. I'm just good at magic, but you know. But it's like he wants other people to, you know, it's to get revenge on that guy, right, for doing this evil thing to him. But he also wants people to see, like, oh, this guy's doing something really evil. Screw this guy. So this guy just harms himself, and that's fine. Like, we all, like, people have anger, and things happen, and they quit. But this requires specific malice. You didn't just have a peak of fury and ruin your computer, and then you calm down. You keep that anger burning and hurt other people for as long as possible. There's a third kind of rage quit. They don't actually quit. The body keeps playing the game, but the mind has different objectives now. This is the guy spinning around in a circle in Spawn, playing Rick Astley in the voice chat forever until the round ends. Right, you're playing a racing game, right? And you don't actually want to quit, but you know you can't win the race. So you just turn around and drive backwards. <laughs> it's notable that in the new Mario Kart, Lucky Two won't let you do that. Ooh. He picks you up and says, nope. And if you keep doing it, he keeps saying, nope. Curse you, Lucky Two. Now, this, we have a whole other panel we had a long time ago on griefing and trolling, the difference between the two, but a lot of those behaviors, one of the main reasons that happens is because of this. So, we already talked, we had second degree murder, second degree quit, we had first degree murder. This is like a step beyond. This is like Sherlock Holmes murder. Like, you stuck around and you're gonna murder everybody. This is Agatha Christie. Right, you know, you can't win the game, you're gonna lose, so you don't, you know, if you keep obsessing about trying to win, it's only gonna frustrate you more because you're striving to climb up this mountain you can. It's a very Sisyphean task, right? So instead, well, you could just quit and do something else, but instead you find another way to have fun, right? So you, even though you, you, know, you, didn't, you could have quit and done something else fun, but instead you just have a new way to have fun with the thing you're already doing. Now this isn't always bad. We used to play a game, Natural Selection 1, long, long time ago. And in the maps, like, there'd be a room, like a ready room, where you get your players. It's an FTS, and you have your players in the ready room, and there's this block of cheese just like on the table. And independently, if you hit F4 in the game, that quits to the lobby. It's like a way to concede. You can always teleport to this room with the cheese in it whenever you want. Yep. And you can rejoin the game from there. So when people would rage quit, like if the Marines are losing, people start spamming F4 in the chat, and they'll all jump into the ready room. So the game keeps going unless everyone concedes, but rather than rejoin the game when no one else conceded, they'll just jump around in that room and have a little party and hang out because it's fun for them. They're making fun for themselves. Playing the, playing the game for fun that is not in the rules of the game is literally the definition of griefing. We often would play a different game, which is how many people can be stacked on top of the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another anecdote. If any of you are familiar with this, there is a gentleman uh, plays Hanzo, Hanzo main, of course. You can't tell Rim's pretty much playing one game these days. I have doubled down <laughs> on Overwatch. I'm a Reinhardt man, I'm really proud of this. So, this person played Hanzo, spelled Hanjo, and he had a goal, a very specific goal, to be the worst ranked Overwatch player in the world. Hey, now, at first, this is really easy. You just join a game and just, you know, lose, right? It's not hard to lose, but then how do you lose when the other people are really, really, really bad? And there's a whole story here, but there's a very interesting part because uh, there's a long interview you can read if you Google for it, and he talks about like all the experiences, and he says something kind of interesting. In the mid-30s, that's like the ranking, that's basically like the left fit, like near the end, near the bottom. He met the angriest people <laughs> in the world. These people, not happy people. Now the people below them, who were so bad, like they didn't know D.Va could fly, and they didn't know Reinhardt had a shield, they were happier than the people in this little valley of death. And this is why. They're, these are people who care about the game. They play the game, they care about it, they want to win. If they didn't care, they wouldn't have made it up to 30, right? They would have been lower with those happy people. They think they're better than they are. 
They have a poor positional heuristic, meaning that they can look at a game of Overwatch and not really understand who's winning or losing or why they're winning or losing. They have no sense of how the game is progressing. But they feel like they do. They think they know, like, oh, this is how you're supposed to do this, and this is good, and this is bad. Like, they feel like they understand the game. They know all the rules of the game, right? There's like, but they don't see the things they don't know, right? They don't know what they don't know, but they know what they know, and they're doing what they know, and it's not working. Their skill isn't going up, right? Their rank is still 30-something, so they mad. But most importantly, they have played the game a lot. They have played the game probably more than I've played the game, but yet they, like many gamers, and gaming kind of primes us to do this if we don't know a lot about how games work, they conflate time with effort, time with training. Just because you play Counter-Strike for a thousand hours doesn't mean you're going to be good at Counter-Strike. Right. If you're someone who wants to get rewarded just for investing time, you should play an RPG or an MMO or something, right? Where it's just, it doesn't matter how good you do, as long as you spend time on it, it's good, you're gonna rank up, right? But this is a skill game. You actually can't, it doesn't matter if you spent your whole life doing it, you actually have to improve your own human body and improve your own skills, and if you don't, then you're not gonna get any better. Another interesting observation he had was they're astonishingly bad. That is a quote. They are astonishingly bad at the game. Right, and this person who was trying to get rank zero, this Hanjo, like was good at the game, but it wasn't like a pro player. Right? It wasn't someone ridiculously good, but it's like <laughs> good enough to recognize how astonishingly bad they were at rank zero. I imagine him feeling like that, that, uh, that classic question. How do you resist the urge just to go around killing everybody and just winning the match on your own? Right? It's that question of how many five-year-olds could you fight if you had to fight a room full of them? Like, I feel like that's what it's like down there. <laughs> now, the crazy thing is that I've experienced that a little bit because one time I solo queued all my ranking matches, so I got put in silver. I am not a silver player, but I got put in silver. Let me tell you, those people are real bad. But they're also astonishingly serious. They really, really, really care about Overwatch more than the people who are better than them and more than the people who are worse than them. And last but not least, they think that the other players on their team are the problem. Mm -hmm. They literally think that they would win, but every round is bullshit, and someone, they get put on a team with these bad people, and they're ranked wrong, and it's their fault. Right, I want you to think about someone who's like at home watching football, yelling at the TV, like my family. Right? And it's like, you don't know a person who sits on the couch more than a football coach whose job it is to win at football, right? And of course, not all coaches are equal. Some are much better than others. But even some low-ranking college football coach knows more about football than Couch Guy. Right? Couch Guy knows nothing. But if Couch Guy thinks he knows something and he calls into sports radio, and like, hey, you should make these trades. Why didn't you call this play, you bum? It's like, <laughs> that's who these people are. They think they know, but they don't know. And the worst part about these people is they can see all the bad things that other players who are playing just like them are doing, and they can't see it in themselves. Or they see someone else doing something, they think it's bad, it's actually good, and they think the thing they're doing is good when it's bad. They see dive comp, and they're like, what are you guys doing? We're gonna lose. So, what do we do about quitting? There's only two important questions. Can the game continue? Can a winner be determined? Those are the fundamental questions from a game design perspective when someone rage quits. So let's look at some examples. This is an interesting example to try to do something outside of our typical realm. June 4th, 1974, in Cleveland, Ohio, which is already a place that has Problems. imagined what Cleveland, Ohio was like, there was a promotion where they would sell beer, glasses of beer, well, bottle, plastic cups of beer. Did they have plastic in 1974? <laughs> For 10 cents. Now, 10 cents in 1974 was more than 10 cents in, you know, but imagine even if in 2017, if you had dollar beer night, right? Dollar beer 50 packs. 50 cents beer night. Dollar beer packs would even be a problem. Now, so, you can just imagine what this looked like, and now we'll show you what it looked like. What could happen? in a baseball game where they sold beer for 10 cents that could prevent that game from, oh, oh no. <laughs> Both teams quit because they formed a circle and fought off the angry fans with baseball bats. I am not joking, <laughs> nor am I exaggerating. The result was the home team, Cleveland, Right? was declared the loser because it was their responsibility to not have 10 cent beer night. So there was a rule to decide what to do if 10 cent beer night happens. 10 cent beer night happened, they followed the rule, the game could not continue. Nope, not in that But game. a winner was determined, and for this sport, for this game, 
That was the most important thing. Who won the game? What were the stats? That's what mattered. Yeah, I mean, this is a real professional baseball game, not just some like game at a table and pack somewhere, right? It's like you needed to determine who won or can re replay the game or something. You couldn't just, you know, do whatever. So what about Overwatch Quick Play or any online game that has a casual mode? Is that four Overwatches now? Uh, there's gonna be like eight more Overwatches. Okay. <laughs> So, in a casual game like this, if you're playing like Sun 6, and someone quits, who cares? There's probably a million people in the queue trying to join games. Grab some random person, stick them in the game, so the game can continue, yes. Can a winner be determined? Yeah. The team that was out of player was only out of player for like 30 seconds tops. That's not going to materially affect a casual game of Overwatch. It's not the Omegathon final, right? You can just be like, oh, whatever, we don't care who won, just meh. Yep. Competitive game. Can Seri the game serious business. So, can the game continue? Technically it can, but it's much like that Newman game, you're not going to win 5 on 6. Especially in a ranked match. So, what Overwatch does is, once someone quits, all the players on their team, they have the option to also quit and not get penalized. The person who quit gets punished severely, and we'll talk about that. But the person who is on the team, that someone else quit from, they're allowed to just leave. A winner is determined. That team just loses. That sucks. We're sorry. But that's because there's no point in continuing the competitive game, because while a winner can be determined, the winner effectively was already determined by the player quitting. That ended the game. It's very interesting that Jeff Kaplan, you know, the, like the game director of Overwatch, this is a quote relatively recently from him, where he said very clearly, they would rather not have leavers playing the game at all. Right. That is an unequivocal statement. Right, so a all. game designer, someone whose job it is to make and sell games, is saying, I'd rather have you not play my game, right? Do not, play, my, do not play the game that I made. Casual, competitive... And I tell game, people to whatever. not listen to our podcast, but yeah. this is someone who's making money on something, telling you not to give them money, right? If you're the kind of person who will quit. Yep, because when you quit a game, especially a multiplayer game, you got to think about this, even the mere act of quitting harms all the other people playing the game. And if you play a game and repeatedly people keep quitting games and ruining your experience, you're not likely to continue playing that game. So game designers have both a monetary and a design incentive to prevent people from quitting their games. What about a light board game like Carcassonne? Like, I'm playing like me, Scott, and Joey, Jojo, Shabadoo are playing Carcassonne, and Joey, Jojo chokes to death on a chicken bone. What do we do? We take Jojo to the hospital. Well, <laughs> I'm like maneuver. We finish the game first. Sure, okay. But, Say a player leaves a simple board game like this. You could probably just keep playing the game, and while that changes the strategy, like in Carcassonne, now we're gonna get like more tiles than we would have otherwise gotten, so like my strategy might not work out as well because we're playing the game by different rules, but we can continue the game, and it'll probably be pretty The game bad. is structured in such a way that it's not completely ruined just because someone walked away from the table. I don't know if they thought about this when they were designing it, it just happens to be the way the game works. If we're on your tile, you put a tile, and you put or don't put a meeple. So if someone gets up and walks away, it's like, okay, that person's score is locked in, and everyone else keeps playing tiles without them. You can just keep going. But what about a complicated board game? So the big difference here is that a simple board game you can figure out the state of the board relatively quickly and play probably nearly as effectively as the player who quit. So if we find some rando to finish our game of Carcassonne while Joe Jojo is choking, that's probably going to be very similar to the game that Joe Jojo had played in. Yeah, you can walk up to our Carcassonne and just start playing even if it's halfway done already. But if you try to join this game, uh, it's going to take me an hour just to figure out what the hell's going on. Which color am I? What, yep. you know, what happened? You know, it's like... I, this hidden things, it's like what, you know, the other, the, a previous person may have memorized, but now you don't know what they are because Based you weren't, the you weren't there when you saw them. This is a three hour buffet that a bunch of people have consumed in bits and bites over the course of three hours. I can sit down and eat the whole thing in 30 seconds and start playing. It's not going to happen. It is almost impossible to replace a player in a complicated game. What about Edward Netrunner? Mm -hmm. Me and Scott are playing Netrunner and Scott quits. Scott takes his ball and goes home. He owns his deck. He owns the physical cards. We literally cannot continue the game. Right, this is why you shouldn't, you know, if you have friends, you know, usually there's one friend who owns all the games, especially if it's a tabletop situation, right? Make sure that that's the good friend, <laughs> right? You know, you don't, if, the, if you have, if the bad friend that you don't kind of, you kind of don't like, you don't like going to the house, if they're the person that keeps buying all the games, you should start buying more games and become the good person who owns all the games, right? Because otherwise, you know, Cartman takes his ball and goes home and then you can't play anything without them and you need to keep this bad person around all the time. I've been in tabletop games where the person who owned the game quit, and they just packed it up in the middle of the game. What are you going to do except not be friends with them anymore? I mean, unless it was, you know, a real reason to leave. Like, so, 
there was sort of an underlying question we didn't ask. Not just can a winner be determined, but does that win count? Right, now obviously sometimes it matters if the win counts, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Ten cent beer night, it matters, and quick play overwatch, it doesn't, right? But if it does count, right, if, if we need to make sure the win counts, it's important, how do we determine whether a win counts? And here's a secret when someone quits. This is something that you can all use. If, a game, if something weird happens in a game and someone quits, you've got to deal with it to prevent the butthurt rage that causes everyone else from quitting, the humble asterisk. Simply say, all right, this game, Joey Jojo choked to death, so obviously there's a problem with this game. We'll keep playing it, and yes, Scott wins in the end, but there's an asterisk next to his win, because yeah. we know there's something yeah. weird. I won it. this imperfect game. That it, you can use this asterisk even in situations that aren't related to quitting. Like, oh, we got a rule wrong. Let's keep playing with the rule the wrong way because we were stupid and we didn't read the rule book properly. But, but we'll keep playing the wrong way, and we'll just put an asterisk. This win doesn't count so much. It counts a little bit. Before I realized the power of the asterisk, I'd been in games where I rage quit. Like, personally, I quit because we got a rule wrong, and once we learned the gnosis of the correct way to use the rule, I would have been winning, but now I'm losing, and now I'm salty, and so I quit. But if someone had said, all right, Rem, asterisk on this game, I probably would have kept playing. Yeah. This is a super powerful tool, yeah, and it is highly effective. The asterisk can remove a lot of rage from people, right? Especially, right? Because it's like, oh, well, I don't have to be so mad about losing this. That person only won with an asterisk, right? It wasn't a real win. I didn't really lose. I can feel better about myself. I don't have to be so mad, even if I'm a sore loser, to yeah. lose an asterisk game. Right? And if someone's a sore winner, you can say to them, hey, you didn't really win, it was an asterisk yeah, game. Yeah, you won, but you were drawing extra cards for half the game. Yeah. Now, actually, the best question to ask, because we're none of us, I hope none of us, well, maybe I hope you are, we're not all professional esports players where this is our livelihood. We're playing games and packs. So it doesn't really matter if the win counts. All that matters is if you finish the game, was it satisfying? Did it feel like you played the game? Because that's all that Do you regret matters. playing? If you could go back in time, would you have chosen not to play the game? Right? And do something else instead? Right? Did you make a mistake, or was that a good time and you spent your time wisely? So here's a case study from the original Left 4 Dead. Uh, if anyone's played this game, there's a multiplayer mode where it's four on four, you play your game, and most people will play the game with like one or two friends and join some randoms. There was a very specific death spiral that would happen in this game. It was pretty amazing to watch it happen so consistently. So if you're on a team that wins, the team that played is likely to continue to play together and thus be cohesive and keep winning. Right, you have four people, you won a game, you stay together, you win another game, it's like, oh, we got a good thing going here. Yeah, let's keep this biz together, you keep rolling. Meanwhile, the other teams you're playing against, they have a rage quitter, and another rage quitter, and then a random person joins in, and then a rage quitter, and then a random person joins in, and a rage quitter. So all these people trying to play Left 4 Dead, the vast majority of the time, they're going to be placed on a losing team, Right? With people quitting it, that's, that's no cohesion, against a team that is stuck together and doing very well. So if you're trying to join random games instead of joining with a team of four prearranged people, you're not going to be joining in the good situation. So think about this. They join, they're more likely to join a game where they are losing. That's one of our things that will cause people to quit. They feel the game is unfair. Someone else quits on their team. It's a perfect storm, and you just leave love the situation where I would say that 100% of the games of this that I ever played resulted in someone rage quitting at some point. It's very, very hard to randomly just get into a game of Left 4 Dead you know, without your friends and go into a good situation. So what do we, what do game designers, what do game players, what do we do about quitters? What are the ways to deal with this situation? And there's a bunch of them. First off, we talked about mitigation. Design games that have ways to deal with people who have left. Like, simple board games might have a rule saying if someone quits the game, you know, this and this and this happens. Have a way to deal with it. Have, make it easy for someone else to join a game that someone has quit. Have it easy in a video game. Like, say Overwatch didn't have a ton of players. So where you couldn't reliably pull someone from the rando queue and stick them to an empty slot. Have an AI, have a bot that'll automatically join any game where someone quits and play okay, just to smooth it over, to, to mitigate. Mitigation doesn't mean fix, doesn't mean prevent, it means mitigate, make it less harmful. There's some games out there like Set, I don't know if anyone's played Set, you can just walk up to a game of Set in progress and start playing and just walk away from it. And you can just leave it on a table and just people randomly do it, and it's great. Right? There's not a lot of games that can do that, but if you can make a game do that, why wouldn't you? That's awesome. Escalating punishment. If someone quits a game, especially an online game, you don't necessarily know why they quit. 
So you can have some sort of punishment, like, oh, you quit, so you can't play again for 10 minutes. But if they keep quitting, if someone reliably quits games over and over and over again, you have to increase the punishment to continuously further dissuade them from quitting, or at the very least, prevent them from continuing to harm others by quitting. It's a classic carrot and stick, right? If the carrot of the fun of continuing to play the game isn't preventing people from quitting in the first place, and they quit, apply the old stick. Sometimes you need a bigger stick. So if you quit a casual game, whatever. If you quit a bunch of casual games, then Overwatch starts taking away your experience points. They start denying you all the stupid loot crate crap that they got built in there. You don't get a perfect record like Mario Kart. But more importantly, if you quit a competitive game, you have harmed people far more than if you quit a casual game. So if you quit a casual game, whatever, it's a quit, we harm you a little bit. If you quit a competitive game, the punishments need to be devastating. And they can, they can lead right up to being banned from the entire competitive season. Graceful exits, we talked about this a little bit. There's some games that just by the nature of their design, if someone quits, it does not materially affect the progress of the game. This is usually happens a lot in games where you're not interacting with the other players directly, like a race. You know, if you're doing a 100 meter dash and somebody just stops running, it's like, all right, that's fine. In fact, you might be happy. Your, your winning chance has literally increased by a percentage. All right, so this game, Factory Fun, which is hella fun, the name is not misleading. Uh, <laughs> in this game, it's kind of a race. You're all building machines independently on your own boards. If someone just gets up and walks away, it's like, okay, their score is their score. They just won't build any more parts in their machine and everyone else keeps building. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Much more rare. And this is something, when we review games on Geeknights and we talk about games, this is something that I look for because if I see it, it implies that the game designer put a lot of care and thought into their game. If there are rules for players quitting, if a tabletop game has a rule that says, if someone wants to quit the game, here is what you do. Because then, quitting is part of the game. It's an option that is explicit and in the rules. You can't fault someone for using it. And the game has a canonical way to continue. It removes the asterisk, and it just makes everything great. It is so rare, I am hard-pressed to name, like, three games that do it. Are there surrender rules in diplomacy, I think? Uh, no, diplomacy, all remaining players can unanimously vote to make the entire game a draw so among can, the remaining players. You can quit players. all together. You can yeah. quit all together so everyone's a draw, and all the people who were eliminated have lost. Yeah, there are a lot of war games that have more than two players with the surrender rules. Like, I surrender, go ahead. In Civilization, you can do that. You can be like, here, I'll gift you all my cities, yep. right? And then, uh, whatever. Now, you're probably thinking, I can think of a ton of games where you can quit. Most of the games that have rules for quitting are two-player games. There's a reason for that. If someone quits a two-player game, it does not need to continue. A winner was determined. That winner, there's no asterisk involved. It's just someone won, someone lost. It's concede. Like the most... Bottom right, buddy. Bottom yep. Right. And in fact, having a concede button in a two-player game is great. Because that way, the person who won can move on to win again. As and opposed the... to sitting there while it says, opponent disconnected, waiting. You can yep. just immediately end it and not sit around and waste your time. Instead of watching that rope, just burn down. Every single turn. They have to sit like connected to do that to you. But yeah. <laughs> Some games just kick you out. Right, so this game is Age of Steam, which is a really, really brutal train game. Uh, and the way it works is at the beginning of the game, you got to take loans out from the bank to pay for your train. Yeah, you don't start with money. Yeah, you're you're a tycoon. You got to take loans. You're not using your own money and <laughs> risking that. Are you crazy? <laughs> Right? And you have to pay interest on these loans or pay them back, right? They're loans. The bank is bigger than you, even though you're a train tycoon and you haven't been able to buy the bank yet. <laughs> um, so what happens is every turn when you got to pay back interest, if you can't, you might go bankrupt. And if you go bankrupt, well, you're, you really can't win the game if you're bankrupt, right? So rather than make you sit there for three more hours while everyone else plays Age of Steam and you're bankrupt, but you have to keep sitting there putting tr like one train out at a time, if you can even manage that, the game just says, you're eliminated, get up and go away. You can't possibly win the game, goodbye. The first time we played this game, uh, Scott was eliminated in like turn three? Turn three, I think. And I was eliminated the next turn, so. And then the other people were still there like a half hour to an hour later, still playing without us. Ending when the game is over. In Pong, the game is not over until you hit 10. But the microsecond you hit that 10th point, the game is instantly over. Right, and the reason Pong is so good is because it's based on the perfect game, which is tennis. Tennis ends exactly when it ends. If you're still playing tennis, you can still win the tennis. 
Even if it's match point, you can come back and get match point for yourself. It's possible. Yep. As soon as your chances of winning are zero, game ends. There's no reason to quit tennis because if you're still standing there with your racket, you can still win. The way you can think about it is every second that goes on beyond the point the game ended and the players are allowed to walk away is increasing pressure in that steam kettle of butter rage. Incentives. Games like Overwatch, uh, Rocket League, pretty much every competitive online game, they give you a bunch of nonsense if you keep playing the game. Hey, if you finish the match, we'll give you some loot boxes. We'll put some, you know, we'll make you salivate for this reward that's entirely arbitrary. See, We're like, right, I'm, you. I'm, I could quit this game because I'm going to lose, but if I keep finish the match, at least I'll get this loot box. All right, I guess I'll just run, run drive around the track back. As a side, when I stream Overwatch, so I don't open loot boxes. Like one day I stopped opening them. Yeah. People get really mad when they see how many loot boxes I have sitting there. How many loot boxes do you have? Only 160. It's not that many. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe. A bunch of them are the new Summer Games one, definitely not open to those. Right. But there is a problem with this. There is a danger if you use incentives. Because if you incentivize people to stay in the game to get some reward, they'll stay in the game. They're going to do that griefing rage quit that we talked about earlier. This is a double-edged sword. Incentives are very dangerous for a lot of reasons, and in this case, they won't actually help you avoid rage quit. They'll just take it down from first degree murder to like assault with a deadly weapon. Shame. Shame. This is an increasingly used way. There's two ways to do this. So Street Fighter V, they announced that they're going to put a little icon next to the names of people who quit too often. Imagine if there were a bunch of people walking around patch and dunce hats. It's like, whoa, that would be so great. You know exactly who not to play a game with. It would be like the greatest thing ever. <laughs> but they're not going to do that. Another way people do this, it's not quite the shame, but they'll do the hell ban instead. They'll make sure that they only match quitters with other quitters. <laughs> and then the non-quitters just get to play with great people. Now, the fascinating thing isn't how effective this is, uh, but the fascinating thing is that if you read any article about this anywhere on the internet for any game, and that article has a comment section, the same comment is there. And it boils down to, but how do you tell if I rage quit versus if my connection dropped? And the answer to that question is, they literally are the same. Right, so a lot of people, this is a legitimate thing that can happen, right? It really only matters for internet games. Your connection can't drop, you know, when you're in person, right? It's like, oh no, I'm, I'm getting disconnected from the panel, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm at a tabletop game and I'm just like, you just phasing out in cyberspace, just a hologram, right? VR rim is here. But no, if you're playing an internet game, your internet connection can mess up and you get disconnected, especially if you're trying to use the Wi-Fi anywhere in this town. Uh, and what happens is like, well, okay, I guess that's the same as quitting, right? You left the game, we can't connect you, but if we, if we allow you, you know, we give you the, the, the uh, I guess we, we accept your apology for your accident, right? We forgive you for your bad internets, then... We have to forgive someone who intentionally cuts off the internet. How can we tell? We can't tell. There's no way for the game server to tell whether you disconnected on purpose or disconnected because the internet's actually bad and you live on a farm. But even more to the point, doesn't matter why. If your internet's bad and it causes you to quit a lot, that harms other players just the same as if you were quitting. You're harming every other player in yeah. the game. Why are you even trying to play, right? It's like, is it really that fun to like join a game for like 30 seconds, play with a 200 ping, get disconnected, and repeat that over and over again? It's like... <laughs> What? It's not fun for you, and it's really making other people's days bad, too. Sorry that your internet sucks. It's, it's not fair. It's not fun, but you're ruining the game for other people. Please stop trying to connect until your internet is good. Now, more importantly, I'm actually very suspicious of this plan because I suspect pretty highly that the people who say this are people who do rage quit a lot and are looking for cover because they don't want to get punished. Yeah, I don't know if anyone knows, like, I think the original Halo, you could rage quit, but basically, like, disconnecting, and it would totally work, and there was yep. no protection for it, and a lot of people had cable modems that had, like, a disconnect button on them, and they would keep, like, their cable modem near their feet and, like, rage quit with their toe, <laughs> right, and to cut off the internet and get back in. When I played MMOs, which everybody gets one, like, you gotta have the experience once and then never do it again, but I played The Realm, which again, places how old I am. Sierra's Online's The Realm. And in that game, I figured out, I didn't know a lot about computers back then, if I unplugged my network cable, as opposed to like quitting the game, the game would not, would basically ignore whatever had just happened right before I pulled the cable out. So anytime I was in a raid, the second I died, I literally had my foot like around the network cable, and I pulled that tab off, I would disconnect it, so I wouldn't lose all my stuff. So. I did the deed, and I know that people do the deed, and I don't trust people to not do the deed. Yeah. 
And so we can't tell if you're bad or good. We have to assume you're bad. And it doesn't matter if you're bad or good because you're harming people just the same as if you're bad. So, And more importantly... Sorry, internet disconnect people. Everything we talked about before with the proportional punishment and the escalating punishment, if legitimately, like randomly, your house burns down, well, you get banned from the game for 10 minutes, you're probably not going to log back into the game in the next 10 minutes while your house is burning down. But if your house burns down every week, either you're actually lying about your house burning down, or you need to move. (laughs) Structure. If it matters who wins, you have a whole meta structure around dealing with it. If you're playing a game, and the output of that game could result in you receiving Lord Stanley's Cup, then there are rules to deal with any potential situation. If you read the NHL handbook, you would be amazed at all the levels they will go through to make sure there are two goalies if goalies keep getting incapacitated. Right. So you come to the hockey game with your goalie and your backup goalie, right? What if they both get hit by a puck? Like right. In the so face? it's like it's, – it's like it happens pretty often. The first goalie has a problem and you need to bring in the second one. And it's more, much more rare, but it's definitely possible it has happened that that goalie is now has a problem. Who do you put in there? You can't play without a goalie, right? And it, the list of who is the goalie goes way down. There are people sitting in rooms in the back, like, waiting just in case, like, watching the game on TV or eating some snacks in case they have to be the goalie. Sometimes the goalie coach, the 50-year-old dude who was a goalie 30 years ago, might have to get in there. It's happened. Now, like you once might, a year or something, it happens. You might think, but what about, you know, in hockey, you can pull your goalie, like that's an option in the game. Why don't they just force them to play without a goalie if they run out of goalies? That's not really fair. Well, much like in Overwatch, if you lose a player from Overwatch, your game's over. If you don't have a goalie in hockey, it's going to be back to that Newman 24-0 to zero, no matter how good the rest of your team is. <laughs> Matchmaking. This is almost a loss at it, but not quite. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but matchmaking is a very powerful tool to prevent these problems, but at the same time, it is a double-edged sword. So matchmaking, like Microsoft True Scale or ELO rankings, or all these different ways to matchmake, to make sure that opponents are equally skilled when they're playing a game, are very effective. They prevent the unfair situation. Yeah, you don't want to have that situation we talked about earlier where I have to play against LeBron. We don't want that to happen. So we use matchmaking. We measure people's skill and we make sure you only play against people with skill that's pretty close to you, right? So you don't get blown out and you don't pick on people and blow them up. Yep. The problem with this, but also the benefit, is that if you have perfect matchmaking, literally every game you ever play will have an exactly 50% chance of winning. If every game you ever play is a 50-50 game and is always super close, you will never feel like you're getting better. You'll never have immersion experiences. You'll never experience the occasional blowout. A lot of the exciting things about sports disappear, and you end up with a game where every round is 0-0 zero to zero and you go to the fifth tiebreaker. Right. Imagine I keep playing a game against Rim over and over, right? But in that I get better. It's suddenly we were winning about every other game, but now suddenly I'm beating him every single time. And now it's like, oh, I can see that I've gotten better because now I used to only beat Rim some of the time, and now I beat him all the time. But if I keep playing against different people and they're always just as good as me, I can't tell that I'm getting better. It just feels like, all right, I kind of win sometimes and I kind of lose sometimes, even though I am getting better. Right? I'm getting way better because I just don't realize the people I'm playing against are way, way, way stronger than the ones I was playing against last week. Now, the narrative aspect of this is important, too, because a big part of why we play games is the experience, the story we tell. Uh, Usually, when you tell a story about a game you played, because no one wants to hear about your D&D character, usually, you tell the story where either you won in a crazy situation, or you lost in a ridiculous situation. The biggest losses and the biggest wins are the most emergent and interesting narratives. If you have perfect matchmaking, you'll never see that blowout. So you almost, like in a professional sport, you need to have the professional sport be wide enough to where the worst team, like Super Aguri, back when they played in Formula One, yeah, they're better than every other race car drivers in the world below them, but they're the worst F1 team. You need that to feel that sense of scale, or the narratives aren't quite as exciting and people lose interest. You can't tell how good the Super Bowl winning team is if you don't have the Cleveland Browns there, right? It just, you can't see. If it's also all Patriots in every city, you can't see anything. So you you need the matchmaking to be good, but not great. You gotta have a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, If you're clever, you would set it up to where matchmaking is almost always as good as it can be, but have a timer where like, 
every now and then, it'll just put the scrubs against the pros and just let that happen. Or the semi-pros against the pros. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I've realized over time that the semi-pros against the pros is just as bad as the moves against the pros. Mm-hmm. The ego shield. This is a very important concept. It doesn't work on people who study games, or people who have gone, been to this panel, I guess, but it'll work on all your dumb friends. So, the idea is that Games that have some randomness, some emergent stuff, like a random event that happens in the middle lane in some MOBA. I don't play MOBAs, I'm just throwing words out there. I'm jungling and a random thing happens. <laughs> so, if you have that little bit of randomness, then the person who wins, their victory is tempered a little bit. Like, I won because I'm smarter than you, but I also got that lucky roll in the fifth round. And if you lose, you can be like, alright, I lost. Because right? I'm dumber than you. Right, and that makes you feel bad. But if I lose, then I can say, oh, I lost because of that lucky event. You know, it's like, alright, he got lucky, beat me, it's good, it's good. But I don't feel bad about myself. I'm like, I played well, I didn't make any mistakes. Yeah. Right? Because the game has randomness, it doesn't make me feel bad about losing. And therefore, I'm not going to quit because, you know, I'm cool with it. I'm not getting mad. So there's this fine line between having enough random and emergent behavior in the game to give the person who lost some justification, even if it's BS. It doesn't have to be real justification. There just has to be enough wiggle room so they can tell themselves and go to sleep that night, I didn't lose because I'm dumber than Scott. I lost because of that BS in the third if round. If they're not mad when they lose, they're not going to rage it. Anti-cheating tools, you gotta make the game fair. You've gotta make sure that no one can cheat in your game. If people are cheating in your game, it's going to ruin your game. Tabletop, this is actually really important. If you design tabletop games certain ways, it's hard to see if someone's cheating. And I've learned from experience, there are people out there who cheat at tabletop games. And that's crazy and weird, but they do it. And they're not even doing it for money. It's not even poker. They're just doing it. Right. Not only if you have cheaters in your game, not only does that mean people will rage quit because they have to play against cheaters. Remember, the cheaters are the rage quitters. They're just, instead of quitting, they're cheating. So you're allowing those people to continue to be in your game. You need to make sure that those people are not playing your game. And then when the good people can play. Equally important to that, you need to have systems to deal with toxic people. People who are being racist, who are being sexist, who are griefing, who are trolling. All those people, you need to have systems that are not easy to game to deal with and eliminate those players. Like Jeff Kaplan said for the Leavers, I'd rather those people not play our game. I'd rather none of these people play our game either. Much more clever than this, the tools, is the design. Make a game where it's impossible to be racist at someone. Yeah, you can't even you can't even talk to people. You just be like, hello. There's like six choices of things to say, like it's a Nintendo game. It's like, and if, if someone starts t saying hello as much as possible, you, hello, 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 you hello, can hello. just put you can just mute them. It's like, all right, let's play. They can't say anything. They can't harass you. Like turn off the voice chat in Overwatch and just lose you. I can do this all day. I can do this. I can do this all day. <laughs> Make losing fun. I'll give you a link to this later. But we gave, I gave a long lecture at PAX Australia on how to make losing fun. So just watch that video and listen to all that. So I just snuck an hour more of content into this panel. <laughs> culture is a double-edged sword as well. Sports culture says never quit. Quitters never win. Don't quit. And on one hand, that's right. good. Especially Quitting itself is somehow bad or shameful. It's like a thing you shouldn't do. It makes you a bad person when you quit, right? You should stick through it and tough it out. It's like, no, no, you really shouldn't. So on one hand, sportsmanlike conduct, the idea that you should suck it up and play the game to the end because that's the sportsmanlike thing to do. But on the other hand, if someone's being racist to you or you've hurt yourself, don't, don't suck it up. Just like, call the police or go to the hospital. So culture, like everything, can be a double-edged sword. We're almost out of time, so where do we go, you, me, and Hanjo, on this incredible journey? <laughs> Quitting is an intrinsic part of games because games are not real life. Don't quit games, except when you're going to quit games. So, if a game is boring, if you're not having fun, stop playing the game. Like, don't play games that you don't enjoy. There's Some so games, many people, they just get mad at a game. It's like, oh my god, this game is so bad. But it's like, well, stop playing it. Play a different game then. Yeah, it's not bad. They well, just keep playing bad. the game and keep being mad at it. There's it, other games out there, like a million of them. Don't say a game is bad. The game may be bad for you. If you're not enjoying a game, just don't play it. If you find yourself rage quitting a game all the time, just play a different game. Play a game that you win at. If the game is hurting you, if you're playing the game to the exclusion of feeding your child, you should probably quit that game. If you run into this guy, you should forfeit the game. No one is obligated to play in a game where they're being harassed. So even an Overwatch competitive, if someone's being racist, like, and you quit the Overwatch competitive game because of it, 
That's totally cool. Take your punishment. It's a protest. It's a forfeit. Do it. If you're going to quit, if you're playing a game and you just got to rage quit, at least quit with grace. Don't murder people. Don't harm the other players. Don't, don't flip people, the table over. Don't type your 100-page essay into the text chat about why you're quitting and how this is an outrage and you people are all animals. Just, just quit the game and walk away. Let it wash over you. Quit and experience tranquility. <laughs> Because your goal in quitting, if you're not a horrible person, is to not experience this game anymore. So quit and be happy. If you quit and you're still mad, you accomplish nothing. And you hurt other people on the way out. And most importantly, if you're going to make a game, make the game so that winning and losing are equally fun. I hope that was enjoyable. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> the case you're not paying attention at the beginning is people don't pay enough attention at the beginning. We have a podcast. It's an MP3. Don't listen to We've it. We've been doing this podcast. Do not. I do not recommend listening to it, but... We've been doing it for 12 years. If the you insist... Thing is on is on the internet for free. There are MP3s for episodes. free on the internet that you can download. Free MP3s. Free. Thousands of them. This card will take you to our YouTube channel that has the lectures we talked about on making losing fun and like 50 other lectures. And you can take this straight to the enforcers to make sure we never come back if you didn't have a good time. And We're thankfully, out. I have no more obligations. This packs. Goodbye. Enjoy the rest of packs. We go to the American finale. Oh, I want to steal the pack from the guy. Oh, it's a screw. No, it's not a screw. Yeah, yeah. I say, never seen any of your guys' content, but this is really cool. Awesome. Uh, really I was awesome not expecting to say false accusations. I've been oh, a Parker so forever. <laughs> <laughs> that is what Early 2000s. I don't know how to undo this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I need to wait for the guy. Yeah, get the AB check. I can't get it out. I had a friend that actually came across the uh, Hanjo guy. Oh, really? In game? Yeah. Oh, like, man.